enemy, this kind of danger, this type of action that would cause this type of harm. Possibly it is true that in most churches we don't end up shooting each other. I hope that remains the same. I don't really want to get shot this morning, but if you shoot me, please kill me. Don't just injure me. If you kill me, I can go home and I'll be happy. But it's, it doesn't work out that way. Usually, here's what happens. It generates to such a point and such anger and such hatred is vented out of our mouth that we kill the other person to never communicate again for the rest of our days, for the rest of our life. The two parties, they never talk. The two parties, they go their separate ways and never have anything to do with one another again. In a sense, the relationship is dead and somebody's been killed. And in a lot of times, two people have been killed. We can apply that to marriage and we'll look at that next week. But there's a destruction that goes on here and it's generated because of what? A desire. Listen in a couple of texts a couple of texts where we use this word desire to try to emphasize how strong this desire really is. You remember the prodigal son? He was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. Same word. He was so utterly starved, he couldn't think of anything but eating the pigs' food. Just, I've got to have something to eat. I'll even eat pigs' food. I'll lay in the slop with them if they'll share their slop with me. Or you remember the man at Lazarus' table who desired long to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Laying there, being licked by a dog, just longing that a piece of bread would fall off the table that he could eat it. This is the type of longing that James is talking about here. Or you could go to 1 Peter 1.12 and it said the angels long to look into these things concerning the beauty of the gospel. It's like they're peering over heaven's door looking to see how God redeems the sinful man. This, this is that longing that is in the human heart and James is telling us we have that and if that desire, that passion is placed upon the wrong thing, we'll hurt tons of people to get it and we won't even care that we hurt them. It's dangerous. Make sure that the desire of your heart is that which God approves of because if you're desiring that which God is against, a lot of people are going to get hurt. Now pause. Whether pastor or whether person in the pew, whether greatly influential or people don't even know who you are, you have the potential to cause great effects upon the local church by trying to meet desires that are not of God. A lot of negative effects. Now, he does give us four negatives. Four negatives in a row. I'm just going to comment on these very briefly and we'll move on. They have that type of desire, but here's the problem. They don't have. Note to self, they never get it. Ever. Misplaced and wrong desires that God doesn't approve of, even if they get what they want, they're not satisfied when they get it and they still don't have it. They never have it. They don't have it now, they won't have it tomorrow, and they'll never get it. If they live in bitterness and strife and continue to let their heart's desires of lust for things that God doesn't approve of reign in their lives, they'll live their whole life like that and they'll die bitter, callous, and totally discontent with life. Hurting people all of their life and never being able to see it for themselves and thinking the entire time the world has done them wrong. Never have. Secondly, so they murder, but then they covet the very thing that caused Paul's conversions in Romans 7 was the law told him not to covet. And here they covet, but they are not able to obtain. They're, they're not successful in achieving or gaining what they're seeking after. Let me give you a positive side. This is negative, but let me give you a positive side. Abraham, he patiently awaited, and he obtained the promise. He obtained it because this was of God. Or in Hebrews 11.33, they, through faith they conquered kingdoms, they enforced justice, and they obtained promises. See, the beauty of obtaining the things of God is God loves to give good gifts to His children. But that's not what James is talking about. They're not seeking good gifts. They're seeking selfish gifts. And as a result of seeking them, they don't have them, and they cannot obtain them. Ever. And like I said, I know it doesn't sound logically accurate, but it is true. Even if they obtain it, 
They don't have it. Say, if I could just obtain a million dollars, if you got it, you wouldn't have it. It would destroy everything that it touched. It's just the way that it works because God's not going to bless that. Thirdly, he says, as a result of not obtaining, you fight and quarrel. Same words, just swapped in order, but the same words we saw in verse 1. I didn't get in my way, so I'm going to throw a kick and scream and fit. You ever seen a two-year-old pull this off? You won't give me those car keys? And they flip down on the floor and start screaming. I remember we watched the, honey, uh, the funny home videos one time, and this kid would flop down the ground and scream, and the mother would walk away, and they'd hold the camera over there, and the kid would get up, and the kid's all fine. As soon as the mother would walk in the room, boom, they would scream again, just throwing an AWOL fit in order to get what they wanted. This is what happens in a local church. This is what happens. People don't get their way, so they go ballistically crazy and, it, and they don't obtain what they're seeking. Thirdly, he says, again, you don't have. But now he begins to offer a little reasoning. You do not have. Why? Because you do not ask. Now, I know the next verse, and I know it's going to say you ask. But before we get there, he says you don't ask. Think about this. They, they don't ask. Try this. There's a church. I've used this illustration before, so I'll use it again. There's a church down south of here, Lake Whitney. I don't remember the name of the church, but my friend served down there. I know this sounds crazy, but I assure you it's not made up. My friend Brett was the youth minister there, and they had a vacuum cleaner committee. I know that sounds strange, but it's really true. And there were two deacons on that vacuum cleaner committee. And you'll never guess what happened, but the vacuum cleaner in the church broke. We've got a major problem on our hands. Okay? You see, because those people on that vacuum cleaner committee want to be in charge. And so they're going to go through all this stuff to obtain the vacuum cleaner that they want for this church. And it becomes a major church fiasco. I'm not making this up. I mean, it got out of control. Well, there was one honest, humble person within the church. They got so tired of the vacuum cleaner committee and the hall, the discussions about the vacuum cleaner, you'll never guess what they did. They went to the town and bought one and donated it to the church. That was a living turmoil. And those two guys on that committee got so mad, blew the church apart, and six months later after the deal was over, both of them had fell over dead. Now, but think of this. You don't have because you don't ask. Can you imagine those two guys doing this? I'd like to call the local church to come on Wednesday night and let's pray and ask God to make us ex officios of the vacuum cleaners and nothing about the vacuum cleaner happens without our permission. We want the whole church to come together and pray that God would grant that to me. I'm not going to do that. It's ludicrous. Why would anybody pray this way? And so they don't have because they don't ask. Why do they not ask? Because their conscience is at war within them, saying that is the dumbest prayer request I've ever heard. And so they're not willing to come and pray about this matter because somewhere deep in the recesses of the heart, they know it's not right anyways. Note to self, when that's true of you, and you know within your heart that what you want is wrong, that's a good sign of the Spirit of God telling you to repent. Oh God... I'm out of line. God, you do what's best. Donate a vacuum cleaner to our church. Whatever bring you the most glory, God. But I don't want my hands on it. Repent and humble yourself before God. By the way, if you ask for good things, God will give, will he not? Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and we do what pleases him. Note to self, what pleases him. Do not be like them. Your father knows what you need. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give you if you'll just ask? But our asking needs to be in line with our heavenly Father. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Now you can take those out of context. You can misinterpret those. But when we ask in a way that is in line with God, God is willing and able and sufficient to bless because he loves his children. But these people are not asking because they know that what they're asking about is not in the hands or, the, or in, the, uh, in the unison with what God would have to be done. Now, verse 3. Passionate prayers without answers. So some of them don't ask. 
But here's a greater problem. You ask and you do not receive. So our fourth negative, you do not receive. Why not? You know, the preacher told me that whatever I asked, it would be given. And I've asked, and, and I haven't got it. And the guy on TV said that if I, if I give $10, I'll get $1,000. And I asked God to give me $1,000. And, and the guy said if I did this, so-and-so would be healed. And I did this, and I asked God to heal, and they died. I mean, I prayed fervently, and they, they, they didn't even make it. And I asked, I needed a new house, and I needed a new car, and I needed all this stuff, and I've been asking for all that, and God didn't give me any of it. And on and on we can make the list go. You ask but do not receive. Well, James is still digging and digging and digging. What is the motive of your heart? What is the motive of my heart? Am I asking in order to receive something that will give God greater glory and that will also be for my good? Or if we get right down to the truth of it, am I asking because I think the world revolves around me? What is the motive? What's going on in the recesses and the depths of your heart? What's driving you to fast and pray? I've had people tell me that many times.